So uh, good afternoon, uh, colleagues. I think we're just about to start. OK, so uh, my name's Stuart McGuinness. I'm the uh, Global Director for the uh, Nature-Based Solutions Group of uh, IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Um, uh, Minister Emmanuel uh, Nionkoro uh, from uh, uh, Burundi and uh, Minister Jose Sebastian uh, Man Mancucci uh, from uh, the Ministry of Agriculture in uh, Guatemala. Uh, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the, this IUCN discussion forum on forest landscape restoration. Now, a few years ago, the uh, Global Partnership on Forest Landscape Restoration estimated that there were two billion hectares of land that offered some type of opportunity for restoration, for restoring the functionality, the goods and services that forests and trees provide. And in 2011, in, in recognition of this potential, leaders from around the world launched the Bond Challenge, a global goal to restore 150 million hectares of degraded and deforested lands by 2020. That inspired um, a, um, an element of the, uh, the New York Declaration of Forests, which was initiated at, at the UN Climate Summit in 2014. And to extend that, the, the idea of the Bond Challenge, to 350 million hectares by 2030. So these pledges and are important, and this, these contributions are nice. And I think we're very encouraged that so far we've got 60 million hectares committed. And I'm hoping actually by the end of, the, the end of this weekend, we will, be, we will exceed 85 million hectares of, uh, um, of contributions. But of course, contributions need to be translated down into action on the ground. And I think there, that is where the really exciting story starts to, uh, to, to, to take shape that in Ethiopia, agroforestry practices are being used to bring, bring back degraded land uh, to improve food security uh, and community resilience and to support sustainable land management. In Costa Rica, the restoration of degraded pasture lands underpins the, 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 the country's green credentials, which in turn supports a thriving ecotourism industry. In the United States, uh, research has so shown that six times as many jobs per million dollars in invested were created from landscape restoration as were created by the 2009 uh, ec uh, economic stimulus package. And this idea of job creation also can be seen elsewhere. In Khyber Pashtunkhwa in, uh, in Pakistan, Restoration has created thousands of new jobs in rural areas that offer the same level of remuneration that uh, people might other, otherwise have to travel to urban areas to access. So actually bringing well, reasonably paying jobs and well-paying jobs into uh, urban areas. In China, managed uh, natural regeneration in key water, uh, watersheds is helping to secure water supply, and this is now becoming an increasing focus of the Chinese government. Uh, also, we're mobilizing resources, FAO, UNEP, uh, IUCN, together with uh, the Global Environment Facility, will next year launch a 50, 60, a 56 million restoration initiative with 10 countries along which will leverage a further 200 million investment. And I will flag up here that the door is still open for those countries who want to get on board to actually sort of to, to, to work this through. We are now building programmatic approaches to both deliver and finance landscape restoration. So all these, all these uh, sorts of initiatives, these tangible on the ground initiatives to get trees on the ground, agroforestry into degraded uh, agricultural land, finance to make this happen, all these bring a significant climate benefit. And in that respect, if we can achieve the bond challenge, then collectively 
we will contribute an additional one gigaton of CO2 equivalent each year to climate mitigation. But FLR, I think, represents this idea of new climate ambition because it goes beyond that. It's not just about the immediacies of climate uh, mitigation uh, and an adaptation. It actually delivers a suite of benefits. We, and sorry, let's stop calling them co-benefits. They are real, tangible benefits that actually help and contribute to meet the broader sustainable development goals. So with that, it's my great pleasure to hand over to uh, the moderator of this session, uh, the chair of the Global Partnership on Forest Landscape Restoration, uh, Mr. Peter Bissell. Thank you, Stuart. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome. And, and thank you very much for making time to, uh, to come to this session. Um, I don't think you're going to be disappointed. We have uh, a, a highly experienced uh, and respected and, um, and varied uh, group of speakers who are going to share their experiences in FLR. And as the title indicates, you know, uh, for potential for achieving old and new climate ambitions. And so we talk about old and new climate ambitions. We're not really thinking of two distinct categories. I think we're talking about the maturation of a concept around climate change. And as Stuart was saying, not co-benefits, but in addressing climate, we're really addressing a good deal more than that. And, and our thinking around FLR is much more robust than I think and around climate change than it was a few years ago, which I think is also <laughs> one of the reasons perhaps that we are, I think, making more interesting strides, uh, but taking strides forward nonetheless. So as Stuart said, uh, I'm the chair of the Global Partnership on Forest Landscape Restoration. I'm there by virtue of the International Model Forest Network, which, which I also head up, and, and several of uh, the sites of which are very strongly involved in forest landscape restoration. So, I'd like to talk a little bit about the GPFLR. Uh, it's an acronym that doesn't exactly roll off your tongue, uh, but it's, it's a really interesting construct. Um, it's uh, just under two dozen organizations, agencies, and countries around the world who effectively, it's, this is a voluntary group, self-mandated, self-assembled, who saw and continue to see an enormous potential in forest landscape restoration to address not only climate, but uh, poverty, quality of life, biodiversity, water quality, many other issues. And by virtue of that, you know, seeing the merit of this approach and seeing it as something that's very concrete and doable, uh, this is a group that has been very uh, central in amplifying that opportunity to larger audiences and creating, as Stuart described, an opportunity now for 60 million hectares and counting, and hopefully by the time that the comp is finished, we'll have uh, higher numbers and higher aspirations to do that. Um, so as Stuart also said, pledging is easy, doing it is a little bit more difficult, and what we hopefully will get from this morning session, or this afternoon session, is some reflection on the fact that this happens at different scales, different degrees of complexity, um, with different partners and tools and so forth. It's very heterogeneous but it's also very accessible, and that's something I hope that we can take away from this. In terms of the GPFLR, we've got some amazing partners that are doing a, a lot of work to help bring tools forward and make them accessible to those who wish to realize FLR. Uh, so for example, IUCN and WRI are working on, their, well, they've developed the Restoration Opportunity Assessment Methodology, which can help countries and other jurisdictions do FLR. And by 2017, we expect that this will be fully accessible to 25 countries. Uh, the United States, as some of you may know, made a pledge of 15 million hectares for FLR. They're well advanced uh, in that, and they're working to deliver seminars on the expertise they have together with IUCN and WRI. FAO, as you may know, is a uh, lead in the forest landscape restoration mechanism supported by the government of Korea. Uh, and the government of Korea has not simply stopped there. They are supporting additional FLR uh, opportunities throughout the world. And of course, we have the bond challenge itself, which the GPFLR supports. And that's an initiative spearheaded by the governments of Germany, uh, Norway, and the United Kingdom. So there's a lot of support at a political level, at a technical level uh, for this. There are, uh, there, and there's a good deal of success that has been realized so far. So, 
FLR, if you look at avoided deforestation, which we really need to pay attention to, the other half of the equation is the FLR. So st stop causing the damage and repair some of the damage we did, and we can do that. So today we have uh, a panel. I'm not going to take up too much more of your time and let our experts speak. And I would like to uh, invite them up as I, I call their names to take uh, their seats. The format for the, the session is that each of our speakers will be invited to uh, address you for five minutes. Um, after that, we'll go to the floor, take a couple of questions for perhaps 10 minutes, and then we'll have a bit of a discussion amongst the group and then return to the floor, time permitting, for any additional questions, and then, and then we'll just kind of wrap it up with some, some key thoughts. So I would like to begin by um, inviting and recognizing the Honorable Emmanuel uh, Nyonkuru, who is the Minister of Water, Environment, Land Management and Urbanism of Burundi. S'il plaît, Monsieur le Ministre, je vous invite. We have also Mr. Carlos Klink, who is the National Secretary for Climate Change of the Ministry of Environment of Brazil. Carlos, please come up. <laughs> we are also honored to have Bianca Jagger with us, who is the founder and CEO of the Bianca Jagger Human Rights Foundation and, importantly, the IUCN Bond Challenge Ambassador. Mr. Ian Gray is the Senior Environmental Specialist excuse me, at the Global Environmental Facility. And Ian, welcome. <laughs> and last but certainly not least, we have uh, Mr. Jose Villaldo Diaz, who is the Head of the Climate Change Department at the National Forestry Institute in Guatemala. <laughs> so for our panelists, we have microphones there. If you're more uh, comfortable taking the microphone, si vous êtes plus à l'aise uh, au micro ici, que là, uh, I invite you to um, uh, do whichever you're most comfortable with. Uh, we'll have five minutes uh, maximum per presentation, and I would ask that you respect that. On a seulement cinq minutes par présentation. On doit respecter les limites, s'il vous plaît. And I'd like um, to begin with uh, Minister uh, Niamkuru, uh, if you would take the floor, please. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, for giving me this opportunity to express my impression of this uh, meeting. But due to our historical position, we speak French, so I will give my my speech in French. I don't know if there is a translator here. Yes, merci beaucoup, mesdames et messieurs. Bonjour. Uh, J'ai l'honneur de partager avec uh, avec vous l'expérience sur la restauration des paysages et peut-être vous donner les impressions sur la, ce qui se fait au Burundi dans le cadre de l'engagement du gouvernement, dans le cadre de la restauration des paysages. Et nous, au niveau du gouvernement du Burundi, nous sommes conscients que la conservation, la gestion durable, la restauration des écosystèmes terrestres et aquatiques et la mise en valeur de leurs ressources contribuent à la conservation de la biodiversité, au développement des pays, à la lutte contre la pauvreté des populations concernées et à la lutte contre le changement climatique. Et nous savons qu'il y a des liens qui existent entre la restauration des paysages forestiers, les stratégies et plans nationaux. Et les paysages forestiers offrent des biens socio-économiques et des services divers à l'homme et à l'humanité. Et dans le but de maintenir, développer et promouvoir ces services, il est apparu indispensable et obligatoire d'intégrer l'aménagement et la gestion des paysages forestiers, d'abord dans des politiques nationales, dans les lois nationales et ensuite dans les différentes stratégies et plans d'action nationaux. <coughs> 
ici, permettez-moi de vous donner certaines euh, activités qui ont été prévues dans différents cadres. Et au niveau du cadre politique, le Burundi a défini une vision en cette matière qui est incluse dans la vision Burundi 2025 pour pouvoir faire face à une destruction de son environnement. Le pays envisage notamment la restauration des écosystèmes par un reboisement intensif, la, prote la protection de la faune et de la flore. Et à travers cette même vision, le gouvernement réaffirme que l'environnement sera pris en compte dans toutes les politiques socio-économiques en tant que composante incontournable du développement. Et à cet effet, une politique agressive environnementale sera mise en place afin d'assurer une gestion durable des ressources naturelles dans les paysages forestiers. Et justement, en politique forestière, la politique forestière précise les grandes orientations en vue de renverser la tendance de dégradation des ressources forestières. Et cette politique a été déclinée en termes d'objectifs généraux et en termes d'objectifs euh, spécifiques. En termes de stratégie, il a été défini une stratégie et un plan d'action a été adopté sur la protection de la biodiversité. Nous avons aussi, au niveau du gouvernement, arrêté une stratégie nationale et un plan national de lutte contre la dégradation des sols. Il a aussi été défini une stratégie agricole nationale. En guise d'exemple, Certaines activités ont été prévues dans le cadre du RED+, et ces activités se tournent autour de la réduction de la déforestation, la réduction de la dégradation des forêts, la conservation des stocks de carbone forestier, la gestion durable des forêts, le renforcement des stocks de carbone forestier. Il a aussi été défini une stratégie nationale sur le changement climatique. Donc, comme le temps qui m'est imparti de cinq minutes est dans le but de préserver ce principe, je conclurai que les politiques et stratégies et plans d'action nationaux tiennent en compte la restauration des paysages forestiers en tant qu'activité d'aménagement forestier, mais nous sommes conscients que cette pratique reste encore à améliorer. Le pays peut donc bénéficier des financements prévus notamment dans le cadre du financement carbone dans le cadre du fonds FEM. Toutefois, il faudrait des études préalables afin de mieux connaître où, quand et comment intervenir et qui va intervenir. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. I'd like now to invite Mr. Carlos Klink to either speak from the chair or take the podium wherever you were most comfortable. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's really a great pleasure being here. Uh, don't know where I put my glasses. Um, I'm going to give you um, a kind of a large picture of the context of the Brazilian case. Um, for many years, actually, now, if we look up from the perspective of climate change and biodiversity, putting together, um, uh, Brazil has been able and capable of advance, uh, make advances in many policies and technologies to face the challenge that we have. Um, maybe the, the most important one starting many years ago was when the Brazilian government decided to monitor deforestation in the Amazon starting in 1988. It's a routine business that we do today, daily. Deforestation have to be there daily. <laughs> it's a tough job. Uh, but it's been key and crucial for the success that we have been achieving for the, la for the last 10, 11, 12 years. Deforestation in Brazil um, dropped by 79% if you compare 2015-2004, for instance. Um, 
Starting around that same time, uh, we, uh, Brazil, uh, started to put its own uh, national system of protected areas at the state level, national level, mainly, also municipal level. But today, Brazil has roughly 1.5 million square kilometers in protected areas, um, about 17% of the country, the size of the country. This is from the perspective of the public side. Looking from the private land side, uh, for many, 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 many years, Brazil had, uh, starting in the 30s or last century, Brazil had uh, what we call the forest code. Forest code has been revised and redone, and most recently, National Congress approved the new version of the forest code. The code is kind of conceptually simple. You tell farmers, if you, if you own a, land, a piece of land in Brazil, and depending where you are, you are supposed to, to have from 20 to 80% of a set aside that you cannot farm. Uh, that gives around uh, 300 million hectares, three mi 300 million hectares. It's a big chunk, almost half of Brazil in private lands. Uh, we are mo monitoring those farms. And now with the new law, uh, registers, farmers are supposed to, 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 to go to a register system. And we have today around 62, 63% of the farms in Brazil under already in this system, monitoring system for legal compliance. That gives us around, in the, declare an, an extra 50 million hectares of standing vegetation, not only forest, because it, Brazil is, you know, has a diversity of uh, ecosystems. And probably, we don't know exactly the, the number yet, uh, 20 million hectares of land that need to be restored or compensated to be in compliance. Maybe this number will grow. Uh, but, you know, some modeling and uh, some exercises have been done scientifically, and the numbers should be around that. Um, based on that, because of that, that piece of law, uh, we, are, we were under public consultation, and we are about to launch the National Plan for Revegetation re Restoration of Brazil. Um, we just approved last week, the President of Brazil signed a presidential decree creating the National Strategy for Red Plus. Uh, we've been working on that for many, many years, three, four years, uh, in accordance to the new, to the framework um, convention or climate change, the Warsaw framework. And uh, looking at not only the Amazon forest, because it's national, so standing forest is going to be important, but also the increase of carbon stocks is going to be important for Brazil. So the Red Plus takes care also of that, that part. We just launched it two weeks ago. We are doing a, a, a very um, um, uh, specific job in monitoring forests in the Amazon. But we just, we need, for all of that, we need to monitor the, the entire country. We just launched the national program to monitor all the biomes in Brazil. Deforestation, degradation, fire, restoration, land use. It's not going to be easy, but uh, I believe that by next year, we already will have uh, the system in place. People in Brazil are working really hard for that. For the Cerrado Savannas, is our next must ecosystem. Also, the Atlantic Forest, and by 2017, 2018, maybe we have the, the, the system, monitoring system for the entire, as we do for the Amazon today, for the entire country. And uh, then comes the climate change side, the, uh, our INDC. Brazil moved, we have a policy, a national policy since 2009, 2010. By 2020, we, we have a mandate, and also we have goals to achieve. But the, the Brazilian INDC changed the, the game in, in the country, moving from the business as usual scenario that we have in the climate change policy today. We are gonna, probably are gonna achieve the, the goals for 2020. We have nine sector plans looking from agriculture, mining, energy, etc. Deforestation land use, of course, is still part of the backbone of, the, of that. And, um, and uh, we have uh, already working, Brazil has probably some guys are like, crunching those numbers around maybe 100 million hectares, more or less, maybe more, on degraded pasture land in Brazil. It's one, one million square kilometers. The ABC, the Low Carbon Agricultural Plan, is taking care of that. There's a huge program investment, around $2 billion already, already invested for the last four years on that program, on, on how to do restoration and make more productive those degraded pasture land for product productivity uh, issues. On top of that, we, we included in our NDC 50 million, 15 million hectares extra additional to what we are doing already for the uh, restoration of degraded pasture land. Uh, five million hectares of a combination of tropical technology developed in Brazil for a combination of uh, pasture land, agriculture, and forestry <laughs> together 
It's still a nascent kind of um, challenge, but uh, we believe that by 2030 we might get five million hectares or more. And maybe the biggest yeah. challenge, we include in our NDC for climate change pur purpose, for carbon sequestration purpose, uh, an extra 12 million hectares of restoration for purple, multiple purpose use uh, of forest. So different animals that we have in Brazil, the big challenge we have today is um, to do a much, much, much better coordination of all those policies. But I believe that the s in setting all, all of those and all the instruments that we have for monitoring and also investments, uh, we just, um, we, we for, the, for, the, for the Red Plus, for instance, uh, scenario in Brazil, we already have the Amazon fund, today a $1.6 billion fund, uh, aiming at several of those areas. Certainly the Amazon fund is going to be instrumental for the Red Plus strategy, but also for the restoration, uh, bigger uh, challenge that we have in Brazil. Let me stop by them, and then we go for the discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Carlos. And um, I have some apologies. With, given the scale of what you're talking about, five minutes does seem a bit of an injustice. So, but thank you. OK, yes, just enough. very well. OK, I'd, I'd like to now invite Bianca to uh, sit from here or there as you wish. To thank you. Good morning. And thank you for being here. It is a pleasure and a privilege to be invited um, to this very important forum. Bonjour, buenos dias, buenos dias. Yeah. So as you heard, I, I was um, appointed a Bon Challenge ambassador in 2012. And I took this role because I believe that the objective of the Bon Challenge is achievable and is critical. It frankly, it is one of the most important initiatives now trying to reduce CO2 emissions and improve the lives of people. And the reason why I took it is because this is not only about planting trees, but this is about restoring degraded land. But the important part of it is that people are at the center of this initiative and that people play, people, communities and indigenous people play a critical role. First, I would like to address what is needed to achieve the goal of holding the rise in global average temperature to be held below two degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels. And in, folk, in, in fact, when I talk about the two degrees, I'm talking more about the 1.5 um, increase on, on degrees Celsius that we should maintain. <clears throat> this will require a number of things and I will highlight some that are particularly pertinent to our discussions today and the deliberations in the COP21 um, and what the Paris Agreement should have. Um, one, to be comprehensive in its coverage of greenhouse gas, GHA, sources and sinks, taking into account all major economic sectors, including the land sector advance the important role that ecosystems-based approaches and nature-based solutions can play in both climate change mitigation and adaptation. Respect gender equality and human rights, taking into account local indigenous and traditional knowledge and the needs of the most vulnerable communities. And clearly recognize and support the substantial and effective role of healthy ecosystems as natural sinks and reservoirs of GHAs. Um, a large number of countries have already acknowledged in their INDCs the important role that better conservation, management, and restoration of natural ecosystems can play in both climate change mitigation and adaptation. And more specifically, they should contribute towards the restoration of 150 million hectares of degraded landscape and forest land by 2020 and 300 million hectares by 2030 through the extended bond challenge. 
I was reading an article that said that the recent studies show that if we were really to focus on, on forest restoration and reforestation towards the world, we will be able to tackle the, the, the threat of the irreversible and uh, uh, climate change uh, and, and dangerous climate change that we are facing in the world today. According to IUCN and climate advisors, achieving the Bond Challenge 2020 and 2030 goals will result in an estimate of 0.6 to 1.7 gigatons of CO2 sequestered per, per on year average. At the upper end, 1.7 gigaton of CO2 emission is equivalent to the scale of emission reduction that could be achieved if all the world's coal power stations fully implemented a state-of-the-art best practices to improve efficiency of energy generation. It also is a close approximation to the total of Russia's annual greenhouse gas emission. So just think for a minute how critical it is, this initiative. It is one of the most important initiatives in the world, and that is why I'm here to urge you all to support the Bond Challenge. If welcoming trees and shrubs back to degraded lands, merely sequestered carrot, some would think that was enough. But we know there are many more reasons for restoration. There are dozens of examples and places like China and Niger and many of the other countries that you will be hearing today where massive scale restoration has been accomplished not to thwart climate change, but to deal with very real natural disasters that our communities are now facing in increasing pace and severity every day. We know what we are facing. The, the threat of catastrophic climate change is right here. And I have great, great uh, doubts that we will be able to have a legally binding treaty that will be able to keep CO2 emission, emissions under two degrees centigrade. As of now, the result and the equivalent is to 2.8 to 3.3 uh, increase of um, degrees Celsius. China has restored millions of hectares of deforested land in order to stabilize water flows in its arid regions and reduce, sun, reduce sandstorms and flood. In Niger, smallholders miraculously transform five million hectares of degraded parkland to have more stable flows of fuel, wood, and drought-tolerant crops. As a result of increased tree density in these lands, crop yields increased by more than 100 kilograms per hectare, producing enough cereals to feed an additional 2.5 million people a year. And why is it that I am so intent and so committed to this um, initiative of the Bond Challenge. It is because I believe that even when world leaders will fail, this will be an answer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Bianca, for, for those thoughts. And I, also going back to your starting statement that people are, are at the center of all of these things um, and couldn't agree more. Our next presenter is going to take uh, a perspective that's not from the two countries or from uh, sort of a people community center, but from the global environmental facility perspective. So Ian, I'd like to give you the floor. Peter, thank you. Uh, first of all, a, a word of uh, apologies from, from uh, Gustavo Fonseca, uh, director of the, the GEF. Uh, he was called away unexpectedly this morning, so I'm, a, I'm a, a somewhat poorer substitute than Gustavo, so please bear with me. Look, the numbers uh, surrounding restoration are, are interesting. Everybody immediately leaps to the 2 billion hectares. Uh, Stuart mentioned them first thing this morning. Uh, I'd, I would say there are other numbers that are even more staggering and I think are, are more interesting. Look, 20% of all cultivated land is suffering from some sort of degradation. One third, 1.4 billion people 
are dependent on on land that's challenged in 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 one way or another. Uh, staggering for me to know that the loss of ecosystem services through degradation costs global GDP about five percent, so two billion hectares. But those, to me, are, are really the numbers that 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 are important. The two billion hectares is, is only the opportunity. The other things are the reason we need to we need to act. I think today is a, a good example of of forest landscape restoration changing from something that, that I would put as a slight hobby, and it's now becoming a a, a a real force to move into the future and try and catch some of the sustainable development goals. It's clear, as as, as Bianca just said, without landscape restoration playing a major role, it's it's really a challenge to see how we can move into the future and come back to these sustainable development goals again. How do we how do we, we, we achieve them? I realise this is not an easy task, but it I think it, it's easier for us if we start to talk about this as a way to address a number of issues simultaneously. Mitigation, adaptation, the ability to absorb shocks, resilience, uh, uh, an approach which helps with rural poverty and development of livelihoods, as well as benefiting biodiversity, water, soil, disaster prevention, a host of other benefits, things like tenure. So there's a lot that's in there. Now, here at COP, yeah, we talk a lot about, about carbon, and that's, a, and that's a big deal here. But it's, and I would agree with Stuart, not to call these things co-benefits. These are multiple ecosystem benefits that we can, uh, we can show and showcase through this process, uh, linked back to not just this COP, but the other two Rio conventions. I think that's in, in incredibly important. And it's not too difficult to, to promote these. And this becomes something which is not just relevant for this week, sorry, these two weeks in Paris, but at every Rio convention that I hope a lot of you will, will also uh, attend. Now, restoration is already underway. We know that. Uh, in Burundi, the minister gave us some good examples. Uh, 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 Secretary Klink also talked a lot about what's happening in, in Brazil. But we've, we've got things with our partners like the World Bank and the Great Green Wall. Uh, in uh, Brazil, there's even uh, other things that, that Carlos didn't mention about the Atlantic Forest restoration, China's Loess Plateau, and, and more recently, things like uh, UNCCD's most recent COP, they talked about the land degradation neutral target setting. Uh, and again, back to Brazil again, the Amazon Sustainable Landscape Program also has a, 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 a restoration piece in it. So you can see there's a lot of work ongoing. But, there's always a but, the big issue is that uh, we really do need to help countries and partners understand that this isn't about just planting some trees. Uh, it's not about recreating former glories. I, as a forester, I love forests, but I always have to ask if we're restoring, what are we actually restoring for? I hope that we're keen to restore into the future, give l landscapes a future in a, sustainable, in a sustainable development pathway. Yes, it's about securing ecosystem services, but it's also about creating business opportunities. Yes, it's, a, it's offering sustainable climate change benefits, but it also provides livelihoods opportunities and options for local communities. It's, all, it's almost sounding too good to be true, I know, but to be absolutely clear, this is still a hard sell in many governments and, in, and also in many boardrooms from the private sector. There's a number of challenges we still need to face, and we need to work harder them. Policies, tenure, addressing incentive incentives, perverse incentives, and also capacity building. There's a, an, an array of different actors and people needed to be involved in this, whether it's public or private, corporate, smallholders, mom and pop activities, international donors, local banks, everything in between that needs to be involved in this, because it's such a complex issue. But if we are there, Together, there's a lot to be won for everybody. Getting communities and forest departments ready for this and new roles and new responsibilities is something which is, which is part of that. To end, I'm glad Stuart mentioned the, 
the, the, the restoration initiative. I think it's something that we're really uh, pleased to be uh, able, able, hopefully able to support uh, in, in the future. Uh, and it, it's something that allows us to, to get behind important initiatives like the GPFLR and the Bond Challenge. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ian. And uh, let's mo move now to our, our final speaker, who's Jose Villaldo Diaz from, from Guatemala. And after Jose is finished, we'll go to the floor for a few questions and then follow that with a moderated session. So, Jose, please. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to me to share this this afternoon and share the, Gu the Guatemalan experience with the forest landscape restoration strategy. Uh, but first of all, uh, I want to give briefly you um, a background about our country. Uh, currently, uh, Guatemala has 3.7 million hectares of forest coverage. Uh, however, uh, we still have some problems with deforestation uh, rates. Uh, current studies uh, show that uh, our deforestation rates are about 1% uh, of the total area and due to illegal logging, uh, pest attacks, and forest fires. And that's the reason uh, we are losing not only uh, the forest in itself, but also the ecosystem services the forest provides. Uh, this is the reason why the countries and the government and civil society and other partnerships are looking for inno innovative solutions to address uh, forest degradation and deforestation that will impact also in the reduction of greenhouse gases emissions. That's why uh, we have some forest policy tools that has been used um, to address some problems, uh, briefly, for example, we have uh, two forest incentive programs. One of them are oriented uh, to promote forest conservation and reforestation uh, with people and organizations who have uh, land title. And but considering that um, the land tenure regimes, indigenous peoples and communities are facing some problems in land registration, in 2012, the Guatemalan government launched a new program for incentives oriented to uh, small landholders and we call it PIMPIP. Based on that experience um, and in accordance to the bond challenge, uh, the last years uh, a multi-sector platform uh, called Roundtable on Forest Landscape Restoration launched the National Strategy for Forest Landscape Restoration in which the government pledged uh, to restore 1.2 million hectares uh, of degraded lands for the next 30 years. Why we decide uh, uh, that goal? Because based on, the, based on the experience of the incentives programs, in 15 years, uh, we have already incentivated uh, approximately 600,000 hectares, which is almost the half of the period horizon we have for the landscape restoration strategy. So now, what we are looking for is try to create a synergies between mitigation and adaptation. For example, we have a national red plus strategy, but as you might know, red is only oriented to mitigation greenhouse gas emission reductions. Additionally, we have a proposal with the Forest Investment Program in which we want to make the link between sustainable forest management with RED. And within the Forest Landscape Restoration Strategy, we want to address not only mitigation, but also adaptation. Because as Bianca says, the center of landscape restoration is the people. The people, forest people, indigenous people, communities in rural areas. Within the forest landscape restoration, we, we not only are going to protect forests, we are also improve the standard of living of the people, improve the income generation, and also try to maintain and sustain the ecosystem services. For example, the forest landscape restoration is integrated by civil society, NGOs, governmental agencies, international cooperation. In this space, I want to give the thanks to the IUCN and FAO who support strongly the elaboration of the forest landscape restoration strategy in Guatemala the last year. Uh, for example, with the forest landscape restoration, we aim at increasing the supply of goods and services from the ecosystems and also linked to markets, increase the management and protection of forests, and promote employment through the implementation of forest management plans and business models, and also to improve biological connectivity. Because as I said uh, previously, we are losing our forests, but also we are developing uh, important tools to try to stop and to reverse the trends that we are facing now. Um, and also one important thing that I want to mention is like uh, all the sectors and multi that are supporting us. For example, now we have the presence 
of the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Livestock of Guatemala. I think Sommer is the executive director of the National Council for Protected Areas. And also there are some representatives of civil society who are supporting the strategy. So now, the goal uh, that we aims at is, for example, try to link everything, Red Plus strategy, forest investment program, landscape restoration, and also these incentive programs we have. Maybe later I'm going to talk about the Proboscis Initiative Law that has been approved just recently, which is another powerful, powerful tool that can be used to address deforestation and reverse the forest degradation also. That's all, thank you. Okay, is this on? It is on, that's great. Thank you very much for that, Jose. Um, and uh, I do think you know, one of the, the benefits of keeping asking for the presentation to be short is that we do have some time for question and answer and to probe a little bit more. Um, there's a lot here that we can probe into. So what I'd like to do is take about 10 minutes now and take questions from the floor. I see we have a microphone here. Uh, this is just the one. But let's just take a couple. And then following that, we've got some additional follow-up of that uh, moderation that I'll be doing with uh, those. So we have two questions here, if we could. So in the third row and then in the fifth, please. My question is to Ambassador Bianca Jagger. I'm from Mexico. And as you know, my country's pledge is to restore 8.5 million hectares of degraded and deforested um, area uh, for 2020. But honestly, uh, right now I'm very worried because there is a misinterpretation of the concept of restoration in Mexico. Um, this uh, pledge is gonna be taken under the Ministry of Agriculture and the Ministry of Forestry. So both have different interpretations of the concept. The Ministry of Agriculture views it as uh, intensification of the production and the Commission of Forestry sees it only as the reforestation of land. So my question specifically to you is, how would IUCN use uh, evaluation mechanisms? Um, so when the country says, here I have my, my number of hectares, you will actually make sure that it is under the same view of restoration that IUCN has. Thank you very much. Well, <coughs> one of the one of the role that IUCN played, pledges, uh, plays when they are pledges made by different countries is to providing them with technical assistance as to how to go about that. So it is my hope that the pledges that Mexico will make will be uh, assisted by the technicians at IUCN like they have done in other countries. And, uh, and that it will result in uh, restoration of uh, the land that they have pledged. Yeah. I wonder if we could maybe offer that question to others as well, because the, I, I expect that the, this is something that's experienced well outside of Mexico as well. And if I understand the question, it's really the cross-sectoral, cross-jurisdictional nature of FLR activities and how you have a coherent <laughs> picture that's shared among those and how that gets done. Is that would Perhaps, do you think that we can have a steward, maybe, uh, who is more technical than me on this particular issue, say a few words about that? Do you have some technical advice for Senator Stewart? Um, thanks. I think actually it's a very, very good, it's a very important question. Um, a couple of things to remember. One is that the ultimately... IUCN, nor FAO, nor WRI, we're not global police forces. We're here to actually add and support uh, technically. Yeah? Decisions ultimately have to be made by the country. But you raise a very good point that, I mean, we've got a history of doing things collectively, doing things badly, and we've also got a history of doing things well. And I think this is part of the value of the global partnership Part of some of these, in, uh, value of some of these initiatives, like the, the one that Ian mentioned, the, the restoration initiative, is that we can actually learn together. We have got in, uh, in uh, uh, Minister uh, Nionkoro's uh, neighboring country in Rwanda, we've actually sat and we've worked through uh, the World Resources Institute 
and IUCN with the government uh, to look at the landscape as a, as a whole. There are some places for, for wood lots to produce <coughs> energy. There are some places in the landscape to produce timber for building. But there is also a very important role. In fact, one of the things we showed in that particular example was that agroforestry, you could not achieve the aims and ambitions of landscape restoration without fully addressing agroforestry that su supported small-scale farmers. If that, if, if, other bits were if that was ignored and we just looked at large-scale plantations, for example, we would miss the boat on the objectives behind landscape restoration. So I think you raise a good question. It is not th that there is not one simple answer. There is no sort of uh, blame or shame type approach to this. We need to work as a collective. We need to build, r rally around the global partnership, around the bond challenge, and collectively learn the lessons of how we can do this to restore a range of a range using a range of interventions across the landscape to meet the needs that society requires, including the communities, including the indigenous people, including government, uh, government priorities as well. Thanks very much, Stuart. Any thoughts? We have three countries here that are dealing with this on, on how you manage that question. If not, that's fine. Okay. Okay, we, we can take another question. I think uh, there's, there's one. There's a, there's a woman uh, identified at the, the fifth row back, and then we... Good afternoon. My name is Maite. I'm studying forestry engineering in Peru, and I heard about the last uh, disaster in, in Brazil, in Rio Dulce, and I want to know if you already have a support or a restoration plan for that, for the National Tour Reserve. We can, yeah, sure, we, we can take a couple more. So the microphone's at the back, and then we can go over here, please. And then, and then Dennis. With thank you. Time. May I? Please. Okay, thank you. I'm, uh, I am Michel Schleffer. I'm working at uh, ECLAC base in Chile and working in all uh, Latin American and Caribbean uh, countries. Um, maybe I have a very basic and naive question. But I think that we are working and we are talking about landscape restoration and not only on forest restoration, isn't it? So my question is, is it compatible landscape restoration with the current main production system we have based on high level of energy and chemical inputs, and if you think it's compatible, how will it be? Or do we have to think about changing the production system to get um, a low carbon system production more suitable with landscape restoration? What's your comment on that? Thank you for that. I think the microphone's over here. And yes, could you identify yourself, yes, please? Yes, hi. Good morning. My name is Sabina Pallas, and I work for a network called the International Land Coalition. We have about 200 members from the internet, intergovernmental and civil society organizations. And we are here at the Global Landscapes Forum to mobilize support for a global call to action on local community and indigenous people's land rights. So in that context, I wanted to ask the speakers, and especially those coming from countries, what role they see for indigenous peoples and local communities in restoring landscapes. Thank you very much. Thank you for that question. And do we have the minister from Guatemala is with us, and I wonder if we might give the microphone to, to him. Muy buenos días. Mi nombre es Sebastián Marcucci. Yo soy ministro de Agricultura de Guatemala. Como ministro de Agricultura de Guatemala, Eh, soy presidente del Instituto Nacional de Bosques. El Instituto Nacional de Bosques está conformado por eh, representantes de las asociaciones de pequeños productores donde participan el sector indígena, participa dentro de la junta directiva del Instituto Nacional, la, eh, los empresarios, reforestadores y participa también la academia, la Universidad de, de San Carlos, la asociación de municipalidades, o sea que somos un equipo 
técnico que vela por la reforestación y por la eh, restauración. Y quiero agradecer a IU, IUCN por el impulso que nos ha dado. Yo explico esto porque sí es muy importante que en, que en los institutos nacionales de bosques o los que tengamos que hacer bosque, estemos eh, representados por todos los organismos. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Minister. Uh, I'd like to take one more question and then maybe turn back to the panel. And Dennis, I think I, I and we'll try to get, we'll have a second round as well, so we, we will be able to come back to you. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Peter. Um, I'm uh, Dennis Garrity, uh, <clears throat> Drylands Ambassador for the United Nations uh, Convention on Desertification. And um, two points come up here in this discussion. One very exciting set of developments, the, um, the regionalization of the uh, land restoration movement. Uh, we have uh, last year launched the um, Latin America Land Restoration Initiative, which is called 20 by 20. And tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. there'll be the launch of the African Restoration Initiative, which I think adds some really interesting momentum to the global partnership. And so my question is, um, how might we reflect on how we can synergize the regional uh, movements that are developing with the global partnership in ways that can actually add even more momentum to this whole process? Uh, the other thing is to respond to the Me Mexico question about um, you know, what is good or bad restoration. And I think that the three environmental conventions are coming to a pretty strong consensus right now that there are three substantive criteria by which you would evaluate and could evaluate restoration. One is uh, an increase in landscape carbon. There, there is a, in, in a given land unit, uh, carbon is increasing. Second is increasing in vegetative cover. Um, and third is an increase in the productivity of the land for the people that are using the land. And I think, uh, as Mexico is quite rightly concerned, if we keep in mind those criteria, which are now being generally accepted for measuring what we mean by land restoration, whether it's agriculture, rangeland, or forest land, I think we can move forward in evaluating what is good restoration and what might not be good restoration. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dennis. I think I'd like to close questions for the moment, but I wonder if you'd do me the favor of giving, can we have the first question repeated, at least for my sake, because I missed it, which was right here. Thanks. I looked at my scribbles and I wasn't able to. For Brazil, okay. Yeah. And then you have it, Carlos? Yes. Okay, well then. Okay. Okay, <laughs> so, so Carlos, maybe we can start with you then. Uh, I, I'd like to, just for that one, and then I'd like to go through them in a series if we can. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? <coughs> yeah? Okay, good. Uh, we are at the moment at the Rio Doce, um, our minister is saying probably the, the worst, the largest environmental crisis we have in Brazil today. Very large scale. Uh, so, but we are at the moment of the crisis, uh, attending to people, um, you know, people died, uh, water quality, <coughs> water distribution, this kind of, this kind of stuff. Uh, damage done to ecosystem monitoring, chemicals, etc. But uh, certainly already, uh, people are on the ground from all tiers of the government, municipal, state, and federal, and the private sector, and the banks, etc., devising what, what should come next. So the idea is exactly to do that, a huge plan for, I would use the word restoration, but on a broader scale, the, of the, the accident. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Okay, so if we take the questions in sequence, the next one, um, it didn't strike me as a particularly easy one. Um, a landscape restoration is not just about forests, it's about, well, there's production systems, agriculture and other production systems. And, and the question is about the degree of compatibility with an FLR agenda given the level of energy that we use to produce what we produce on these landscapes, I think. And so is there, are, we, are these things compatible? And if they're not, do we need to change a production system so that it's consistent with an FLR agenda? I think if I captured it, does any, anybody like to speak to that one? I think it's an important question. We have a, a, fairly, a fairly 
muscular infrastructure that supports business as usual, um, and we have an FLR agenda. Uh, so is there a trade-off here? Maybe I'll, re maybe I'll regret this, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's an incredibly difficult uh, topic. Yes. I, uh, hopefully, with the number of people in the room, we are uh, in, a, in a, a time where we are, we're starting to think about these lower carbon pathways. Now, uh, I also see that there is a, there's a need, if we're going to meet the if we're going to meet the, the needs of a, a population which is going to be 9 billion people before too long, we really are also going to have to th be a little bit sharper in the way that we do agri agriculture, uh, which I think ne by necessity means that we'll have to do more with, with, with less, uh, definitely with less new area. Uh, and I think th this... It's not forest, land, forest restoration, it's landscape restoration. Forest may well be a part of that. It's getting that, m that mix correct. From, from our perspective, from my perspective, I see this landscape restoration as being the restoration of landscapes in their absolute entirety. And in those, you will have the full suite of potential land uses from strictly protected all the way through to hardcore agriculture, be that small scale, commercial, big scale. It has to have, it, by necessity, we have to do this using the full range of tools that are available to us. We have a second chance with these landscapes. Let's make that chance actually work this time. I think we need to plan and we need to make sure that we are able to squeeze out the maximum value for everybody, for everything, but we have to be clever to do that. And I, I think we do need to be more intensive uh, for agriculture to be able to do that. Thank you, Ian. Do we have any other thoughts from the panelists on the question? Carlos, please. I, d I don't have an answer, of course, you know, straight answer, but I think I can uh, bring some um, perspective from Brazil. Um, if you look at the, you know, all the, all, all the instruments and the mechanism that uh, you just, just said, and the systems, uh, for, for the last two years, for instance, using all those policies, all those um, achievements, all those experiences that we have in Brazil, uh, let's say the first code, for instance. The first code is, uh, of course, it's a kind of a legal compliance. Millions of farmers they have to comply, you know, with the, how much set aside they have to, to have there, restore, or, but most importantly is how to use that kind of instrument, uh, going a little bit further beyond, which is how we're going to devise our the best way our landscapes. That's in a, in a way is already happening in Brazil, but the, the thing is how to use that also to make it uh, a much larger scale. I can give you a lot of examples of uh, municipalities, for instance. I remember working back a few years ago in a different position. Uh, I, I was visiting a city municipality in the state of Mato Grosso. It's called Lucas do Rio Verde. Lucas at that time, even today I guess, I might be wrong, was uh, represented 1% of the soybean production in Brazil, one municipality. And Lucas at that time, divided, they, they had a, a necessity for legal reserves, et cetera, 30,000 square uh, hectares for, you know, for to be in compliance. And uh, they devised a, a municipal plan for the entire municipality on how to use mapping, satellites, legal reserve, etc. Not only to be in compliance, but uh, how to devise better the, you know, the landscape and to produce more in the land that they are ha already heavy and how to do the restoration. And this is uh, what we start to, to see happening in Brazil. Two years ago, we launched in, uh, the conference in Warsaw, the Brazilian government launched the, uh, one, one strategy that they call production and protection. And today, there's a huge momentum in Brazil. Just recently, there is a new, several, but a, a particular uh, special, special one, coalition of a private sector NGOs on forest and agriculture for climate change, doing exactly that, I using the instruments, the intelligence, the monitoring for the entire country. 
of uh, how to make the better this combination of a production, yields and uh, productivity, and uh, at the same time using those policies as a, as a plus, as a benefit of the production system. Because I agree, you know, I mean, we have, a, we have a Brazil 45, 50 years ago, Brazil was importing food. Brazil at that time couldn't produce enough food. We're importing food. Today, Brazil is one of the largest exports of food, bioenergy, etc., in the world. So we have to make a, a, a better combination. In our case, I'm, I'm quite almost sure, I guess, uh, very much convinced that we can do this. If you look at the productivity of Brazilian agriculture, even beef, even beef, it's increasing tremendously. The, for the 15, 20 years past, I mean, our production, if you look at the first in the Amazon, going down, and at the same time that the production productivity in the Amazon was going up. So we're starting to see a decoupling of that at that big scale. So this, I think, uh, if you have the, the policy rights, the, but uh, the, you know, the instruments right, the incentives right, and uh, also the engagement is not, uh, if you still are in the polarization environment versus production, I don't think, I don't see you know, much of a future there. But I see at least this huge momentum in Brazil in support of the first code, for instance, coming from the private sector and the financial sector. Financial sector is supporting the first code in Brazil exactly to achieve this kind of uh, result for, for the several sectors in the country. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. And Jose, you have some thoughts on this question as well. Yes, I, uh, so, yeah. uh, I will briefly uh, address uh, the question if landscape restoration is not only forest restoration, that is right. Um, I think it depends also uh, the local context of the country that uh, landscape restoration is being carried out. Uh, just for example, uh, I would like to mention that in the, the case of Guatemala, landscape restoration in fact combined both agriculture and forestry practices and activities. Uh, to mention, uh, for example, the, the uh, restoration strategy is being leading for three main governmental institutions. Uh, the Minister of Agriculture that will be is in charge of uh, agriculture, livestock, and food, and they will implement activities to restore the graded lands uh, uh, dedicated for agriculture. And National Council for Protected Areas will be in charge of making restoration activities inside protected areas. And the National Forestry Institutes will be in charge to restore forest lands outside protected areas. It depends the role of the institution we're playing in. And, and also, it depends also the approach we want to use. Uh, we can use also agroforestry systems, so we can also use uh, land sparring or land sharing. It depends also. For example, we have already developed a map for potential areas to be restored, and we identified five main areas. And depends not only on the social context, but also the environmental context and biophysical context. So I mean, landscape restoration is an integrated approach, and the way how the countries will address it depends of local context, depends of the environment, and depends also on the social context. Can I say, Bianca, can I please. Say briefly, I think that the whole concept of landscape restoration and and the objectives on agroforestry as well that has been employed should have, we should depart from the state status quo and all the bad practices that we had until now that didn't take into account how to protect the environment. So I totally agree with you, and probably this is too short to go into it, about what practices with regard to agriculture we should be regarding. And then we should think about the benefit of uh, the communities the benefit of the environment and move away from some of the practices that have been used. And this I speak for me, not necessarily for IUCN. And I will say move away from GM food and from other practices that are harmful to the environment, to the people and to all of us. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Bianca. So I'd like to move now to the next question, which was, as a, uh, the role of indigenous uh, peoples in forest landscape restoration. I wonder if I can exercise a bit of license as moderator to enlarge that question in, in a couple of ways. One is specifically, yes, how can indigenous people, what is their role, how can they be engaged? But because there are many other actors on the landscape, including smallholders who are not indigenous, but who are key to this, I, 
uh, the question maybe if I could ask you also to ask, but how in a general way do you engage those communities and how do you incentivize, if that's the right word, the FLR opportunity for, for those communities, indigenous or not, who have to be part of the solution? And I wonder, uh, sorry, Bianca, we can go, but I'd like to ask uh, Minister uh, Niankuro's uh, view on that question as well, and I can provide a, a French version of it. Version France des questions, si ça vous va? Okay. Okay, so Bianca, uh, Minister, could, uh, do you have a, a view on Burundi's approach to engaging communities, stakeholders, indigenous people as part of the FLR effort in your country. How do you engage en français? Comment chez vous à Burundi vous engagez vos communautés autochtones et non autochtones dans les paysages pour soutenir les efforts pour FLR for for, for landscape restoration? Comment les engager? comme membre de l'équipe pour réussir. Au, au niveau de la restauration des, des paysages forestiers au Burundi, euh, la politique est la même. On ne fait pas de distinction entre la, les autochtones et les autres populations. C'est une, une approche intégrée qui met sur le même pied d'égalité et, et les populations que je dirais normales et les populations autochtones qui sont associées, chacun dans son domaine. Mais la politique nationale est globale. Il n'y a pas de différence entre les, les communautés, oui. C'est comme, comme approche. L'approche, c'est qu'il y a certaines couches de la population qui se sentent un peu écartées. Mais que, au niveau de, de l'approche d'intégration, on essaie de les associer avec les autres. Et disons que c'est uniquement dans la mentalité, mais ce n'est pas au niveau du traitement. Puisque le, le, la population bénéficie des mêmes traitements bénéficie des mêmes enseignements et bénéficie des mêmes concours du gouvernement. Il n'y a pas de, de séparation. Mais il y a une couche de la population quand même qui se dit autochtone qui à un certain moment n'arrive pas à pouvoir s'intégrer. Mais actuellement, on est en train de les mettre dans les différentes institutions pour qu'ils puissent se sentir comme des autres euh, couches de la population. Okay, thank you for that. So there's no real distinction between the two communities, but there's some who require additional effort to, to bring them on board. Thank you. So Bianca, you had some thoughts on this question. Well, indigenous peoples are the best uh, custodians of the environment. So there is a lot that we can learn from them in the restoration um, work. And they have played an important role and when I, in Bonn uh, you had uh, the meeting uh, where it was developed, the Bonn Challenge, uh, indigenous peoples, communities, the business, the business community as well as government played a role. So I think that we will gain a lot by, uh, by including indigenous peoples, by learning from their knowledge and by following many of their good examples on protecting the environment. Thank you. Carlos? Thank you. Uh, a few things here, maybe. Uh, um, uh, recently, I mean, a few years ago, Brazil approved a, a, a long-term kind of demand coming from indigenous population on how to deal with the environmental plans for that territorial area. And uh, so there's a piece of law now and uh, the Amazon fund, by the way, is investing a lot on those plans, uh, plans for monitoring and uh, restoration is becoming part of that, indigenous, uh, uh, of ind indigenous land. On the participation that I understood also, the question was also on the participation of uh, communities and indigenous populations. Uh, for the Red Plus uh, uh, strategy of Brazil, for instance, indigenous populations participate along the way. Uh, they are participating also in the construction that we are, we are right now uh, preparing the safeguards for Red Plus. It's a must, it's a necessity, according to the convention. Um, we are about to finish next Monday. We are under public consultation, the National Plan for Adaptation, for instance. It was interesting, the engagement of local communities and vulnerable populations, as we call it, became one special, very strong and very special chapter. You know, the, the, the care that we must have, that people are demanding, 
uh, on vulnerable population because of climate change. So they also participate in the, in the construction of the national plan for adaptation. And we, we, we uh, even included that in our INDC. It's, it's the preamble of our INDC. Um, uh, the thing may be is, of course, those are all very good news, but uh, uh, the Climate Change Fund of Brazil is investing on restoration, the dry lands, the Caatinga dry lands in, in the northeastern part of the country. It's a par particular type of vegetation, savanna-like type of vegetation. Uh, restoration is a must. We've been investing in that for <coughs> with the Brazilian Forest Service uh, in trying to replace um, um, not the production system, but to replace use of natural forest or natural vegetation by management of the natural vegetation. It's a challenge because uh, at the small scale we are, we're being able to achieve you know, a more coherent, more landscape approach for that. But when you go to, to increase that scale or the level of, uh, you know, to achieve larger places and more people, I think that's part of the, of the challenges that we all, we all have. Okay, thank you, Carlos. And Jose, you have some thoughts on how to engage indigenous and other communities? Yes, about the role that indigenous communities and uh, rural people play in landscape restoration. Um, I would like briefly to mention uh, the experiences that Guatemala has I in regards to, 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 to that issue. Uh, just to mention, uh, the round table for uh, landscape restoration uh, has uh, 42 uh, organization that, that supports uh, the, that initiatives. And many of them are a grassroots organization. Uh, um, that uh, we strongly believe that uh, any initiatives leading by any institutions uh, won't be uh, succeed if, if grassroots organization and additional peoples are taken into consideration. As Guatemala uh, has um, approximately 50% of the total population are indigenous. They belong to indigenous communities. And sadly, in the last years, indigenous po communities are being marginalized. However, uh, the situation has been changing. Uh, uh, as an example, if, uh, we have a really nice and, and exemplary case of, of incentives program that is dedicated only for small landholders, and most of them are indigenous communities. They have a network organization that play an important role in the decision-making processes. Uh, when we talk about institutions also, we not only talk about bureaucratic or formal institutions, we're talking about social embedded or informal institutions. And Guatemala is taking the lead on taking into consideration these groups. Um, and now uh, we have representatives of indigenous groups in all the official commission for the COP also. Uh, and going back to the country, we're still working on the national adaptation plan where indigenous communities are also included. So um, finally, uh, to mention uh, the national strategy also is uh, now is setting on the field some uh, pilot projects which aims to include traditional uses, traditional knowledge uh, that uh, communities have been used in the past, <coughs> but however, the uh, the science uh, has not been taken into consideration, but now uh, the uh, situation are changing, and they are important and pivotal in our strategy. Uh, and finally, as, as, as another example, is in, the, in our new initiative programs, there are a category, a ma management category dedicated only for landholders, that people that, people that don't have a land title. Indigenous communities, mostly of them, they don't have land right titles. And that's why they are sometimes marginalized from, in, from national initiatives. But now they are taken into consideration. They are part of the game. They are part of the table. They are stakeholders. And, they are, and their boss has been paying, uh, has been uh, uh, calling the attention. Thank you, Jose. And uh, I think that the last point's uh, an, an important one of making them genuine stakeholders rather than just a, another group to consult with so that they're part of this and it's theirs. So Ian, at the risk of putting you on the spot, the, the Jeff is, of course, is responsible for moving a lot of resources in a lot of project areas, and whether in FLR or, or not, I expect that there's been some analysis of best practice, and this is, or, or even observational things about things that the Jeff has supported, where you think there have been patterns that tell you that this is how things uh, can be done right in terms of engagement at of those communities. So, any thoughts? You don't. You can say, no, I'll take a pass, but. I would probably take a pass. I think what's been said here already in terms of real, these are real examples from, from the countries, I think that's enough. Okay, okay. So, fair enough. So we'd like, we have one more question that was posed by Dennis, but I'd like to go to Carol for a second and ask, f just for a time check, I was gonna bring my something time measuring device up here, I didn't, are we doing okay for? 
Okay, so the last question is on regionalization and how we can capture those synergies that Dennis asked. So I wonder if we could, just, we'll do re really rapid fire responses. I'll try to do a summary. <laughs> Yeah, I'll try to do a summary uh, of all of this. Okay, any, any takers on the regionalization? Okay, regionalization, we've got lots of regional organizations. We need to get them, yes, we need to get them involved. We have to get these guys involved. However, I would say, uh, in addition to that, we still need to make sure that uh, restoration's seen as something to uh, be proud of, and, 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 and there's a, not a business opportunity, there is an opportunity to be made. Uh, to do that, we have to stop seeing this as being a burden, but something which we can do something positive out of. Uh, it's getting the opportunity known. Uh, as a forester, I'm going to say something horrific, and all other foresters say it. If we have foresters only talking about this, it's the death of it. We need to have the finance guys excited, the agriculturalists, the planning, the environment people. They all have to be there. The, the local communities, indigenous groups, they all have to be excited. This is something to grasp and move forward on. Uh, so it's an opportunity. We can get people moving, but... We have to have some progress. We need to have big examples working that we can be proud of and share. Thank you, Ian. Any thoughts, other thoughts on regionalization and FLR? Okay. Well, I do have one, if I could offer quickly, Dennis, and then I'll maybe move to a summary, which is uh, in the Model Force program, one thing that we saw, you know, it's a global network, but in fact, networking really takes place uh, at a not global level. And so one of the things I hope we'll see with FLR is as the 20 by 20 initiative takes root and hopefully in Asia and otherwise, where we have sort of linguistic, cultural, and ecosystem similarities and where you get a track record of successes, you've got peer-to-peer -peer linkages that can accelerate this, build confidence into approaches and methodologies. And we've seen it work in the Model Forest program. There's no reason, that it's, it's not unique to that. So I think that the regionalization is very positive because I think that's where you can probably think it's going to really uh, basically get momentum going. So um, I'm f I was asked also to summarize, <laughs> yes, and I did take notes, and I'm actually, yes, a final round? I was, do we have time? 30 seconds? 30 seconds? Okay, well, okay, 30 seconds, and then if I run out of time, you'll have to do it without my pearls of wisdom. Okay. Thanks. So, uh, let's start with you, Carl, or start at yeah. the end with the uh, minister. I think, uh, okay. um, you know, made, made me thinking from regionalization to globalization, uh, if I may. Let's, uh, of course, restoration of forest land use is absolutely necessary for biodiverse water benefits, climate change, no question about this. But let, please let's not, not forget. If you look at the, the numbers of IPCC last year's report, uh, emissions, global emissions, are rising steeply. Land use and forests are declining, actually, in the, in the world. Fossil fuels and cement are increasing tremendously. So forests and land use resources are going to be playing a big role, no question about this. But uh, that represents today, in terms of emission, 15, 16% of the emissions. Most of the emissions still are, you know, the huge elephant on the room. Please let me Never forget this. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Carl. Monsieur le Ministre, une dernière pensée? Observation? Non, il n'y a pas d'observation particulière, mais je sais que, à ce qui est de la gestion des terres, il faut une certaine politique intégrative, inclusive. C'est pour cette raison que quand j'ai fait mon exposé, vous avez entendu que j'ai parlé de, la, de ce qui est de la gestion de la terre en termes d'agriculture, en termes de changement climatique, en termes de déforestation, en termes de dégradation des sols. Donc il faut qu'il y ait une approche inclusive pour une gestion meilleure. Merci. Bianca. Uh, to avoid catastrophic climate change, we must engage in various initiatives. Um, that are not per perhaps part of the governments. But the um, one challenge and the land restoration is probably one of the things that give us hope that we can really tackle climate change. And uh, it is my hope that more and more governments will come forward and will pledge to uh, the bond challenge so that we can think and look forward to the future without thinking that everything is lost. 
I'll just say, uh, remember to promote the opportunity, and that opportunity depends on, on, on who you are, whether it's a production, production nexus, or whether it's it's private sector getting them involved, and may need new, pro, uh, new types of uh, finance uh, in there to get them, get them in, or whether it's building capacity within smallholders and indigenous people, or, or it's retooling forest departments to, to stop being the, 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 the police, but being the facilitators of, 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 of things in, in, in of this type. So uh, promote the opportunities. Very good. And Jose, some last thoughts from you. Yes. Um, one challenge and landscape restoration initiatives are uh, international uh, initiatives, but in our case, our strategy responds to, glo to local needs, uh, which is to restore and maintain the graded lands and also maintain the flux of, of ecosystem services. Uh, but because if we look at our net emissions, Guatemala only contributes with less than uh, 0 0.5 of greenhouse gas emission. So it means that, uh, but however, the country is one of the most vulnerable across the world. That's why uh, the civil society and the government is, is, is taking the action, is working on the field. To, to take important actions and reverse uh, our current situation and also sustain and maintain not only forests but also the productivity land because also this Guatemalan society depends strongly on agriculture, agriculture inputs, which arms, which our goal is also to increase uh, increase the production, the productivity, the incomes that at the end will impact on the livelihoods of, of people, mainly rural population. Thank you. And if I could, just a couple of final comments. I won't try to summarize. Um, the two things, the question of, of engagement, I think, is, is really critical, whether it's forest landscape restoration or managing forests sustainable. We're not engaging people for tomorrow or for a project. We're engaging them forever. And it means addressing the incentives that make them do what they do. It also means incorporating new thinking into the sort of the culture of, of, of how we do things and why we do them and, and, and an understanding of the impacts that we individually and collectively have on the landscape. So that's pretty tough stuff to do. It requires time. And so if we're patient with the process and mindful of these things, and if we, we engineer our interventions fully mindful of these, these things, the question about the different sectors not really seeing eye to eye, it's absolutely critical that you know, the future success is probably going to be largely measured by the degree to which you spent the time in the early stages to set the stage, to get it right, to make sure that the sectors understand that their role in this and that there's a common picture. Um, I had a conversation last night, just to fi finish up, I'm with someone on climate smart agriculture, and it's something that I'm a complete layperson on. I don't know a great deal about it. I think I understand. I could probably pass a ag climate smart agriculture 101 quiz, maybe. Um, but by the end of the conversation, we said, agreed that sort of, well, this is actually just smart agriculture, isn't it? And, and it's like many of the things we're trying to do, and as Stuart said, there's, we're here because of climate issues. But on the landscape issue, there's not just co-benefits, there's all sorts of very smart reasons that we want to do these things, to restore ecosystem functions into them for multiple benefits. So I think it's m important to be, yes, climate smart agriculture is good, and, and the, the, the hooks that we get into these things are good, but there's a, an extremely, there are multiple reasons for us paying attention to forest landscape restoration. And there's a, a very rich body of work about how we've been getting this right in restoring landscapes for a very long time. So let's not, let's not um, intimidate ourselves by thinking we have to have 150 million hectares tomorrow or that we don't know how to do this. Let's do a few hectares tomorrow and let's remind ourselves that we have tools that we can use and colleagues who know this stuff. So, so we'll just go and do it. Thank you. Thank you to our panel.